So today we are in week six of our series called The Upside Down Kingdom in which we're looking at a teaching that Jesus gave during his time here called the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is really all about showing us what it will look like if we are transformed by a relationship with Jesus and live out this brand new way of life called Christianity. So today we are looking at what Jesus had to say about money and possessions. Uh, We're going to specifically be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. So what I'd like to do is read that on the front end. In verse 19, Jesus said, Don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can be a slave of two masters, since either He will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and and of money. So what I want to do during our time together this morning is based on Jesus' words, just, just answer three basic questions about money. First off, how money exercises its power over us. Uh, Secondly, why money exercises its power over us. And then thirdly and finally, uh, how we can break the power that money has over us. Uh, So first off, how money exercises its power over us. The answer to that is found in verses 22 and 23 where Jesus said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of light. Darkness, and I want to stop it right there. So, what what Jesus is saying here is 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 fairly simple. Uh, wherever you are right now, wherever you are listening to this or tuning into this, there is probably light in the room that you're in. And if your eye is working, if it's good, if it's healthy, uh, then it'll take the light in, and by that light, you will be able to navigate the room that you're in right now without stumbling or tripping or running into stuff because you'll be able to see. But if your eye is not working, uh, then you're in trouble. Namely, because there is no other part of your body that can take in light for you. And so if your eye is not working, your whole body, in a sense, will be full of darkness or in the darkness, uh, even, even if you are surrounded by light, simply because of um, the failure of your eye. So the question is, what does that have to do with anything? All right, the verses before Jesus talks about the eye all have to do with money. The verses after Jesus talks about it all have to do with money. So why did Jesus seemingly interrupt himself in order to talk about eyesight is the question. And I think the answer becomes clear if you pivot over to Luke Luke chapters 11 uh, and 12. Because in Luke chapter 11, Jesus gives this same exact illustration that he does here in Matthew. And he talks about money. But then when you get into Luke chapter 12, all of a sudden Jesus starts talking about the need to watch out for this thing called greed. And so Jesus' point here, he's saying that, that greed and materialism, which is really just, it's an inordinate desire or, or dependence on money and material things, it has this very strange effect on, on us as people. What, what greed and materialism, which is basically the power of money, the effect that that has on people is it has a tendency to uh, blind us spiritually and to greatly distort the way that we see basically everything in this life. And all of that brings us to what's going to be our first idea this morning. It's number one, that money distorts the view we have. Money distorts the view we have. And one of the primary ways that money does this is by blinding us to the hold that money already has on us. Uh, I I remember hearing a a story from one of my favorite pastors. You may have heard of him. His name was Francis Chan. He pastors a church out in um, Simi Valley, California, and so his congregation tended to be uh, more affluent, and so he spent a lot of his sermons really preaching, um, kind of warning people about the dangers of the love of money and and the importance of generosity and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, And he told this simple story one time that, it was actually years ago now, but, but it, it stuck with me. Case in point, I still remember it today. 
And, and he said that, that pastoring in Simi Valley, California, he said person after person would come into his office and, uh, and it was so common for, for him to hear people lamenting how, you know, somebody in their life had changed, whether it was their spouse or one of their kids or one of their friends, just somebody that they were close to and, and, and how this person changed and they're not who they used to be and they turned into somebody that's, you know, ugly and superficial and all this kind of stuff. And, and time after time, uh, the culprit was always the same. The thing that changed them was always the same. It was always linked back to money. Um, Time after time, year after year, Francis heard this, and he stopped in the middle of his story, and, and, he, and he asked a question. He said, but you know what no one has ever said to me? And I was on the edge of my seat, because the way that, that, that Francis Chan would preach, he just always had me leaning in, and I always wanted to hear what he was going to say next. He said, you know what nobody has ever said to me? He said, time after time, people come, come into my office, and they say, Pastor Francis, money really changed them. He said, but I have never once heard somebody say, Pastor Francis, money has really changed me. I was thinking about that story this week and, and it dawned on me that I can honestly say, I, I've been pastoring for over seven years now, and, and uh, a little over seven years, and, and in that period of time, people have confessed uh, pretty much every sin there is to confess or to talk about with me. Matter of fact, on a number of occasions, people have come into my office and shared things with me uh, that, that in, in uh, some cases they've never shared with anybody else. If you, if you can think of it, I've probably heard it or something close to it. But I can honestly say that in more than seven years of talking with people and meeting with people and listening to people, not once has someone ever scheduled a meeting with me in order to come in and talk about their greed. And so the question is, why is that? Uh, and and, and let, let's talk about what the answer is not. The answer is not because none of us struggle with greed. All right, it's just because none of us tend to recognize greed in our own lives. And that is exactly the point that Jesus is driving at here. He's explaining that this is different than any other kind of sin. That's what makes it an eye sin. It darkens our eye spiritually. So you don't have to tell somebody, watch out, because you might be committing adultery. People, generally speaking, know when they're committing adultery. They know when they're committing all kinds of different sins, you know, spoken of uh, by the mouth of Jesus and all throughout the word of God, but we don't know when we're being greedy because according to Jesus, it hides itself from us and it actually blinds us. And, and, and so I say all that to say this, kind of on the front end of this talk about the power of money. If, if listening to this topic, you've already kind of, you know, leaned back and maybe tuned out and, and you've thought, well, you know, this doesn't really apply to me. You know, I'm not really a materialistic person. I don't really struggle with greed. But I can think of a number of people who need to hear a teaching about this. If that's your mindset, that is actually a really bad sign. Because according to Jesus, a surefire sign of greediness and materialism in your life is, the, is the, the complete lack of willingness to even consider that greediness and materialism might be in your life. And so Jesus said to watch out for this thing because it's an eye sin, it's a sin of the eye, it'll darken our eyes spiritually. In, in, in other words, it distorts the view that we have. So if, if that's the power of money, if that's what it does, then, then I think the question is, well, what, what, what does that actually look like when it's played out in our lives? And what I wanted to do is give you three examples that I think are so commonplace in our culture that we wouldn't even necessarily recognize these unless we were going back to what Jesus said here. I mean, just three examples of this. First off, um, let's say that you're choosing a job. Uh, the, the power of money, once it begins to change the way that, that you see things, money has the power to cause you to choose a job, not because you love the work, not because God has uniquely gifted you for that particular line of work, and not because that work really helps people in the world, but simply because that job or that line of work is gonna make you the most money. And so you take that job and that line of work uh, because in making more money, it's gonna you know, raise your status and, and, and therefore your, your quality of life. And, and for a number of years, that might sustain you, you know, because it's fun to have more money lying around, you can afford different things, you know, the, the toys, the vacations, all that kind of stuff. But after a few years, what that inevitably is going to lead you with is, is j just basically a, a sense of emptiness and lack of fulfillment and lack of satisfaction and lack of purpose. And so many people get to the end of their lives uh, with this kind of overarching feeling that they have wasted so much of their time here because they spent so much of it dedicated to a line of work that they never cared about to begin with, that they found no sense of purpose in, that they were never satisfied by. And, and the reason for that, more often than not, according to Jesus, 
is that their eye has been darkened because of the power of money. All right, that's one example. But, but here, here's another example. Money not only uh, has the power uh, to blind you in choosing work, uh, in the choosing of your work, but also in the conduct of your work. All right, let me just tell you something that you already know. There's a whole lot of companies in the world today that are very profitable, but they're profiting at the expense of neighborhoods and towns and real people just like you and I. Their elevation means somebody else's devastation. And there might be hundreds, there might be thousands of people in that company or in the companies that are doing that. But as their company is destroying the quality of life for people, the employees and the people attached to and and, and profiting off of that company are not saying, man, I, I find such a sense of fulfillment knowing that we're profiting at the expense of others. Right? Only a sociopath thinks that way. So the employees of companies are not generally thinking that way. They're just not thinking about it at all. They're not thinking at all about the impact that their company or their line of work is having on society generally because it's easier to not think about those things. It's easier to just turn a blind eye. And again, that is exactly what Jesus' point is here. All right, greed does not cause somebody to say, you know, at last I'm gouging the poor like I've always wanted. There's more homeless widows because of me. Greed doesn't cause people to say things like that or to think things like that. Greed causes us to stop thinking altogether. It causes us to stop thinking about the impact that we have all together. And if, if you and I are utterly unwilling to think along those lines, to follow those avenues where they might lead, to ask those questions, then again, it's because the power of money and greed and materialism has darkened our eye. But, but thirdly and lastly, and this one kind of hits, hits most home, I think for all of us, what money has the power to do is, is it can keep us from asking ourselves questions about the lifestyles uh, that we're living. So, so for instance, let's say that you're tuning into this. Let's say for, for, for sake of this illustration that you're a professional. Uh, if, if you're a professional, then it's, it's very common in your line of work to meet or come across other professionals that in some cases are making double or even triple what you're making. Uh, you know, no matter where you land, there's always a course, there's always a bigger fish. There's, already, there's always somebody... Um, above you, and the people that are above you that you're looking up to, of course, have, have people um, looking up, that they're looking up to, that are above them, and everybody's always trying to catch each other, right? Uh, the, the point is this, when you get locked into that mindset, and into that way of thinking, and into that way of living, what happens is nobody ever really feels like they're rich, because they're always comparing themselves to somebody that has more than them and therefore is spending more than them. And when you get caught up in that, you never stop, you never pause, and you never ask yourself questions like, wait a minute, do I really need to be spending money on this? Do I really need to be spending this much money upgrading my house or on these vehicles or on these clothes? Uh, Again, you're never gonna stop and think like that because you're always comparing yourself to people who have more than you and therefore spend more than you. And so you never stop and think, wait a minute, isn't there a way that I could spend less on me so that I could actually give more to the poor or give more to the church or give more to my friends or more to my neighbors? You're never gonna stop and ask those questions. You're not even gonna wanna think about those questions. You're You're not gonna let your mind go in that direction Uh, And and, and again, according to Jesus, that's because money has really darkened your eyes. So at the end of this this first section of this teaching, I I just wanted to kind of pause for a second and say this. If Jesus is right, I'm just thinking logically here, if Jesus is right about this thing called greed, and, you know, spoiler alert, I think he was right. I think Jesus was right about everything that he said. I think he really was the son of God. And I think that if somebody successfully predicts and pulls off their own death and resurrection, then we should listen to everything that guy has to say. So I think that Jesus is right. But if Jesus is right about this thing called greed, that it does hide itself and it blinds us to its existence in our own life, then just logically speaking, that means we cannot trust ourselves to diagnose it in our own lives. I mean, if Jesus is right, then it's, it's, it's irrational for us to think that we are going to be able to avoid falling into greed and materialism and coming under the power of money without the benefit of an outside voice. And so all that to say, uh, I'd just like to ask you a a question, and this is specifically for everybody tuning in right now who claims to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Here's the question that, that, uh, that I'd like to ask you based on Jesus' words, I think we should all be asking ourselves. Are you accountable to anybody? 
specifically as it relates to this particular topic. What I mean by that is, have you ever gotten together with, with other Christians, with your brothers and sisters, uh, or, or maybe a group of Christians, to, to figure out and talk about and, and corporately, mutually decide what generosity actually looks like and how much you're gonna spend on yourself versus how much you're gonna give away? You know, the question is, has, have you given permission to anybody to speak into your life about that, and has anybody given you permission to do the same for them? And if, if in hearing a question like that, if, if, which admittedly, I mean, that goes against the grain of everything that we hold dear to in, in this country, that you know, we're all about our rights and our money and our lives and our pursuit of happiness and all that kind of stuff. If, that, if the thought of a question like that or doing something like that, if the first thing in your mind is, I don't want to think about that, I, I just want to point out here, again, that is exactly what Jesus' point is about this thing called greed. That it's, it's that money has the power to keep you and I from asking ourselves questions about how we, we make our money, about how we spend our money, and about the hold that money already has in our lives. So first and foremost, this is the power of money. Money uh, distorts the view we have. All right, now, now I said I wanted to answer three questions in this teaching, so now I wanna turn to the second one. And the second question I wanted to answer is uh, why does money have this power? Why does money exercise its power over us? And the answer to that is gonna be our second idea this morning. It's that money reveals the things we love. And you find this in Jesus' words in Matthew chapter six, verse 21, where Jesus says, very famous phrase, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, when you really start thinking about this phrase here, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, it's actually, I don't think it's as simple as it appears. It actually took me a little bit more time than I expected to really get to the bottom of what Jesus is saying here. But what Jesus is basically saying is that the place in which your heart really rests, that is revealed, whether or not we want to admit this or not, or we like what this is re revealing about us or not, the place in which our hearts really rest is revealed by money, meaning... If, if you want to find out what your heart is really set on, what you're really living for, what's really driving you, what's really in the center of your will that you're fixated on, all you need to do is look at what you're spending your money on and what you're hoping your money will be able to buy you, to procure for you. All right, and, and, and generally speaking, I've talked about this before in, in, in teachings that I've given. Generally speaking, people have a tendency to fall into one of two different camps. Uh, some, sometimes people have a tendency, uh, generally speaking, to look to money for their significance, uh, while other people have a tendency to look to money to give them security. And depending on you know, which camp you have a tendency to fall more into, this is going to manifest itself much differently in your life. But I, I thought what would be helpful is kind of painting a picture of what this looks like. If you look to money to give you significance, then you will feel important. Um, you'll feel important because of the things that your, your money is able to provide for you, you're gonna buy those things and basically use them as a, you know, a billboard to show people how significant you are because of the things that you can afford. So you're gonna feel important because of the home that you can afford, the neighborhood you can afford to live in, the cars that you're driving around, the clothes that you wear, the restaurants you can eat, and all that kind of stuff. And if you go down that road long enough, then you will inevitably find yourself living on uh, either side of a two-sided coin. All right, on, on the one side, you will feel very inferior to and you'll be very envious of people who have more money than you. But the other side of that coin, the very ugly side of that coin, is that you will also catch yourself feeling very superior to and actually looking down on people who make less money than you. And in your mind's eye, when you see them, you're not just gonna think of them as people who make less money than you. You're gonna think of them as, 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 as people who are lesser people than you, All right? This is why so many people have a tendency to look down on and talk down to the poor. Nobody wants to admit that they're going through life like that. Nobody wants to admit that they secretly view people like that, but it's the way so many people go through life, Sp specifically in a country as materialistic and consumeristic uh, as ours. And the reason for that, according to Jesus, is that they have made money their significance. All right, but, but maybe that's not you, and, and, and you're, you're the other type of person. You look to money to give you security. If you look to money to give you security, this is gonna manifest itself far, far differently. If you look to money to give you significance, you're gonna tend to spend it. 
and then use the things that you've bought to kind of show people and prove to people how significant you are. But if you look to money for, for your security, you're not going to spend it at all. And that's because people uh, looking to money for their source of security only really feel safe if they have a lot of it lying around. Uh, it's their money that makes them feel like uh, they, they have some measure of control in a world that is otherwise uncontrollable. The problem with that, obviously, is that there is no amount of money that can actually make you feel safe. There's no amount of money that can really make you feel stable, can really make you feel secure, can really give you the measure of peace that I think all of us are looking for. And so once you go down that road, you'll find yourself always worrying about money, always feeling like you don't have enough money, and you're going to make financial decisions that cost you personally in ways that it's a steep price to pay. It's going to cost you relationships. It's going to cost you your reputation. It could even cost you your family. I've seen all of that happen. But that's what Jesus is driving at here, that the power of money is that it seems like it can give us significance, and it seems like it can give us security. But the great, mon- the, the great irony is that when you and I look to money for our significance, it turns us into this really, really ugly, really arrogant, really superficial person that nobody likes, and so we wind up losing our significance in the eyes of other people. And if we look to money for our security, we will, f- we will wind up feeling more insecure than ever, Because the lesson that every single one of us eventually learns in this life is that money cannot protect us from any of the things that we fear the most in this life. No amount of money can protect us from from pain, from broken relationships, from loss, from tragedy, or from death itself. And so the question is, how can you and I be freed from the the, the power, the hold that money has on, 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 I think, everybody to one degree or another? And Jesus gave the answer to that question actually at the very beginning of this section that we're looking at. It's in verses 19 and 20. Jesus said, Don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So literally what Jesus is saying in these verses is don't treasure earthly treasures treasure heavenly treasures. I I think it's important to point out uh, the reason Jesus compares and contrasts only these two ideas of treasuring earthly versus heavenly things is because ultimately um, those are the only two options we have. And what I mean by that is every single person tuning in to this right now, every single one of us has something that we treasure, you have something that you treasure in the very center of your soul. We all do. And what it means to treasure something is um, it's, to, it's to look at something, to, to think about something, to dwell on it, to fantasize about something, and to really fill your heart with the, the beauty of it and the worth of it and the value of it. All right, the, the thing that you treasure is the thing that you have told yourself, anything I have to do to get that is worthwhile. Because once I finally have that in my possession, then I will be, and my life will be worthwhile. All right, right, everybody has something, whether it's, you know, for for some people it might be relationships, it might be romantic love. You know, some people just completely lack the ability to be single for any length of time because life is not worth living unless somebody else, you know, loves you in a romantic sense. That's your treasure. You know, it, it can be romantic love, it can be money, it can be career, it can be you know, acceptance, approval, being respected, being admired, control, family, whatever it is. Every single one of us has something that functions as our treasure. But what, what I think so few people realize is, is that whatever our treasure is, in a very real sense, we are enslaved to that thing. And the reason for that is because the moment that our soul treasures something, the moment that we, that we set our heart on something, we will pay any price to get it. We will do anything. We will sacrifice anything in order to get it. Because, because to you and, and to me, whatever your treasure is, it's worth it. And so in, in every sense of the word, I, I mean, a treasure will drive you like a taskmaster through this life. It will not forgive you if you fail it. It will exhaust you, and it will always be just beyond your reach. But what the Bible is, is, is teaching us is that while every earthly treasure will insist that you give your life to purchase it, Jesus is the one treasure who gave his life to purchase 
you. And so what that means is that making Jesus your supreme treasure really is, at the end of the day, it is the only way to be free from the power of money. Now, if I left you there, then this would be a completely useless teaching because telling people, well, you need to treasure Jesus above all else, that's fine. If that was a switch that I could flip in my own life, I would have done that a long time ago. So the question is, how do we treasure Jesus like that in a way that frees us from the power of money, from the power of all kinds of things? And the answer is by understanding what Jesus has done for us in the context uh, of, of this concept of, of treasuring things and money and possessions. See, the, the gospel shows us that Jesus had ultimate significance. He had ultimate security. He had ultimate love. He had, he had ultimate glory. The point is Jesus had everything that we all scramble through this life desperately trying to get our hands on. He had all of that. But when Jesus came to earth, and hung on the cross for us, in a very real sense, Jesus lost all of his treasure. And I just want you to follow me here. The only reason Jesus would do all of that, the only reason that Jesus allowed himself to go through all of that is because what he stood to gain was more valuable to him than what he chose to lose. And make no mistake, what Jesus stood to gain by going through what he went through at Calvary was you. What I mean by that is you were the only thing Jesus did not have before the cross that he knew he could only get through the cross. And so I just wanna let you into my my head as I was putting this teaching together. There's there's this one idea that's been kind of rolling around my mind all week as I was putting this teaching together. If the value of something is determined by the price one is willing to pay for it, then I'd like you to ask yourself, how valuable must you be to God that he was willing to give his own son for you? And how valuable must you be to Jesus that he was willing to give his own life for you? To understand the gospel is to understand that Jesus treasures you personally. In fact, I wanna state that even more strongly I think it's entirely appropriate to say that you don't fully understand the gospel until you understand that Jesus treasures you, until you understand the significance you have in his eyes, the security that you have in him, until you understand that in Jesus you already have access to all of the things that the human heart most desperately desires that money will never be able to give us. And when you know in your heart that Jesus looked at you and he thought about you and he said to himself in his heart that nothing is worth losing them and anything is worth saving them. When you know that he treasures you like that, it will free you from all kinds of things and it'll free you from the power of money. And according to Jesus' words here, there is one, there is one, according to this passage, one surefire sign that this love is becoming more real to you and you're growing in your, your, your treasuring of Jesus. There's one surefire sign that this is happening in your life and that brings us to our last idea during our time together today and that's that Jesus transforms the way that we give. I know we already looked at this verse but in chapter six, verse 22, Jesus said the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is, and I want to focus on this word, good, your whole body will be full of light. See, that word good, uh, in 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 the Greek, it has a double meaning. What it also means is generous. In fact, this is the literal definition of this word. It says, openness of heart manifesting itself as generosity. So what Jesus is teaching here is that a Christian who has really been set free from the power of money... By, by coming to understand how much Jesus treasures them and treasuring him in return, a, a, a person who's been set free that way, what's gonna happen is they're given, they get a generous eye. In other words, the lens through which they look at the world will never be the same. You know, we, we've called this series The Upside Down Kingdom, and it's all about showing how this lifestyle of following Jesus is radically different than any other lifestyle. The kingdom of God is radically different from the kingdom of this world. This is just another manifestation of that. Because in a world where you know, people primarily, the lens through which we, na- we all naturally look through life is, is primarily, if not exclusively, centered on what can I get? 
What can I gain? What can I, ma- what can I amass or accrue for myself? Jesus is saying that when the gospel becomes real to you, you're gonna go through life looking at life through a lens to do the exact, you're gonna look for opportunities to do the exact opposite of what everyone else in the world is trying to do. You're gonna look for opportunities to practice generosity with your friends, to practice it with your neighbors, with your church, uh, with the poor, with, every, with everyone that God brings into your life. And, and, and if going down this road has you asking yourself the question, okay, well, well then how much should I give? The answer to that, I think, is found in simply looking at what Jesus has done for you and for me. See, when, when Jesus treasured us, he did so sacrificially. In, in other words, what I mean by that is his love for us came at great cost to him. And so I, I heard a pastor explain it this way, and this was really convicting to me. He said that what, th- what this means is that for Christians, I'm speaking to Christians now, what this means is that for Christians, we should give enough money to the point that it actually causes us to make sacrifices in the way that we live, in our lifestyles. And he went even further with that, and he said, if our giving makes no difference, meaning if it's so sporadic or it's so minuscule or we never give it all, if our giving makes no difference in our lives and never causes us to, to have to make sacrifices for the benefit of others, then we have to come to grips with reality. We're not responding to Jesus the way that he responded to us. We're not responding to the needs of others the way that Jesus responded to our needs. And, and so what that means, maybe that means the tithe because frankly, you know, 10%, which is what the tithe literally means, uh, 10% is a sacrifice, but maybe it means more than that. Because for an, increasing, for an increasingly growing number of people in our country, 10% doesn't even make a debt, doesn't even put a dent in what they're making and what they're earning and what they have. But the point is this, that for Christians, the standard for our generosity is the, is the cross. The standard for what generosity should look like in our lives, the ultimate example of generosity that should inform our generosity is the cross that Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to. And so the question that, 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 that all of us need to ask ourselves, no one can ever really ask you this question except you, and certainly nobody can ever know the answer to this question except you. But in light of what Jesus has done for us, the question that we all need to ask ourselves if we claim to be his followers is very simply, is there a cross in my life? Specifically to Jesus' words here, is there a cross in my economic life? Because according to Jesus, when we understand what he's done for us, and we treasure him, what that will always lead to is generosity that looks radical to a watching world. And we're not gonna, we're not gonna practice that generosity begrudgingly. You know, it's something we have to do. We're not gonna practice that out of fear that we'll look bad if we don't or other Christians are gonna judge us or anything like that. We're gonna practice that kind of generosity out of an awareness that nothing we could ever give can compare to what God has already given us in Jesus. So I just wanna stop here and we're getting ready to land this plane, uh, but I just wanted to mention this. If you have hung around for the last two teachings, you know, we've just gotten through Jesus' words on finances, and, and last week we talked about Jesus' words regarding sexuality uh, as it regards to the Christian lifestyle. If you have hung around for both of those teachings, then you have hung around for what's probably gonna be you know, the bumpiest part of this series, so I really appreciate you tuning in. Um, for whatever reason, what Jesus has to say about sexuality and finances seems to step on our toes uh, more than anything else in this culture. So if you've tuned in, then I really appreciate uh, you hanging in there with me. But what I wanted to do at the end of this little kind of two-week mini-series about sex and money, you know, in the, in the context of this greater series as a whole, is I wanted to share a letter with you that I just became aware of this week. Uh, it, it's a letter known as the letter to Diognetus. It was written in either the the second or the third century. And it was written to a man named Diognetus who was not a believer. He was not a Christian, but he was uh, was a seeker, he was curious, he was a little bit skeptical, but he was interested. And so this letter was written to Diognetus to explain to him why Christians grew so quickly in their popularity in the ancient world and what made them so different from every other group of people on the planet, what made them stand out so much. Uh, I'm just going to read a few sentences from that letter to you, but I found it really inspiring to me, and so I, I hope that you find it the same. It says this, referring to our brothers in the second, and sisters in the second and third century. It said, they share their table with all, 
but they do not share their bed with all. They live in poverty, but enrich many. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. See, in the Roman Empire, pagans were, were known for being incredibly promiscuous with their bodies, Uh, while being incredibly stingy with their money. But then this group of people that were called Christians came along, these people who supposedly believed in this Jewish carpenter who died and supposedly came back to life and then ascended into heaven. This group of people called the, the, the early church followers of Jesus, Christians, they came along and they were the exact opposite of the pagans throughout the rest of the Roman Empire. That they were actually stingy with their bodies, meaning they were faithful to their spouses, But then with that, they were incredibly promiscuous with their money. And so I don't think it takes a a, a lot of brain power to figure out why Christians grew in their popularity and in their influence so quickly. Because just think about it this way, which type of person do you think benefited their neighborhood? Or if you want to make it personal, think about it in these terms. If you were a child, or if you were raising children, and I know a lot of you tuning in are raising children right now, What kind of neighborhood would you want to live in? Would you rather live in a neighborhood full of people who were promiscuous with their bodies but very stingy with their money? Or would you rather live in a neighborhood full of people who practice sexual integrity but financial promiscuity? Because a city filled with that kind of person, a person that has truly been transformed by their relationship with Jesus and is living that out in the public square, a city filled with that kind of person is going to be a healthy city. And a neighborhood filled with that kind of person is going to be a healthy neighborhood. And a family filled with that kind of person is going to be a healthy family. So listen, in in this corona era that we find ourselves in, people are experiencing all kinds of problems. They're going to experience all kinds of problems. But one of the specific problems that's going to show up in people's lives, one of the specific types of hardship is financial hardship. I know I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. But in light of everything that Jesus had to say, about how his people are to treat their money and their possessions, I I cannot help but believe that this is an opportunity for Christians once again to show the world that we are a people who have been so moved by the radical generosity of our God toward us that we cannot help but practice that same radical generosity toward them. And for every single person listening to me right now who is a follower of Jesus, what we all have to accept is that that is exactly the kind of people Jesus has called us to be. So I just want to leave you with this. Let's be those people. The world's going to need those people. The world could really use those people. So let's be those people. That's it. And that's all.